November 29th, 1926. A 48-year-old widow named Blanche Myers is discovered, strangled to death, a knot around her neck, stuffed under a bed in a rooming house that she maintained, which, according to the address provided for the location of that residence, would have been somewhere right here, probably between this large apartment complex and this other house here, along this dead end stretch of Southwest 10th. This murder captured the attention of a whole city, but also flashed a new light on other murders or deaths that had happened previously. This is the story of the Dark Strangler. The carnage began on the afternoon of October 19, 1926. Charles Withers, a 15-year-old Benson High School student, returned home from school on Lincoln Street in southeast Portland. Upon his return, he expected to see his mother, 35-year-old Beta Withers, there. But the house was empty. Out of concern, Charles went and got help. He began searching the house for missing clothing that his mother may have been wearing, leading him up to the attic of the home. He opened a trunk full of clothes and began rummaging through them, when suddenly he discovered the body of his own mother at the bottom of the trunk. The clothing had been placed over her. There was little evidence of any struggle or attack. The only marks found on her body were around her hips and a small amount of blood was recovered from a pillow in her bedroom. Beta was last seen alive a couple hours earlier by a neighbor, who described her as being in an unusually happy state. It was unusual as she was known to be rather morose at times. This led authorities to consider the possibility that this was, somehow, a suicide. There just happened to be a framed piece of poetry that Beta hung up on the wall in her house that discussed building a box to put all of your troubles into. If she'd taken her own life then, theoretically, she had placed all of her problems in a box. But by this point, her cause of death hadn't even been established yet. It was felt the most likely cause of death by suicide would have been poisoning but no poison was found in her system. This led the police to next figure that she had suffocated herself in the clothing that had been placed in the trunk. But in the end, it was established she had died of a broken neck. A fairly difficult and unlikely manner for one to take their own life. The matter would ultimately go before a coroner's jury who were split on whether they felt this to be a case of murder or a case of suicide. But Beta Withers was not the only strange death that was to occur during this period of time. On October 22nd, only three days after her death, 59-year-old Virginia Grant was discovered in the basement of what was a vacant home at 22nd and Tibbet Street. Grant had been fixing the place up to rent, and when she did not return home after leaving to show someone the place, her two sons-in-law went to check on her and found her body. This death was hardly covered in local press, and even now, almost a century later, little is known about Virginia Grant or her death. Her death was first reported on in papers on October 24th, even though her time of death was reportedly on the 20th. Her death was initially said to be from natural causes, as she did have heart problems, 
However, it was noticed that multiple items of jewelry had been removed from her person. This made it seem more likely that she'd been robbed and murdered in the basement, or possibly the shock of the robbery had instigated a health event that killed her. Her body had also been found behind a furnace in such a state that it's unlikely she would have fallen there on her own, but was rather placed there by the assailant. While Virginia Grant was unknowingly facing her final moments on October 20th, not too far away in Portland's Selwood neighborhood, 37-year-old Mabel Fluke was busy out in front of her rental home, cleaning it up as she had just put it up for rent. She made a point of saying she would be there on that date, in case any interested parties wanted to inquire about the property. She appeared to have gone missing after this, with family believing she'd traveled to the town of Independence, Oregon, where she used to live. When it was learned she hadn't been there, Mabel's father began searching for her. When he couldn't find her in the St. John's neighborhood where she lived, he accompanied a police officer to her Selwood rental home. A search there revealed Mabel's dead body. She was found in the attic of the home, just like Beta Withers. She'd been strangled with a scarf that was still around her neck. It was noted that a $250 diamond ring was missing from the home. Three deaths in Southeast Portland in less than three days. While there was still a great deal of controversy as to how these women died, it was quickly becoming feared that a madman was on the loose, murdering women in the city of Portland, and nobody had any clue who he could be. A Mrs. M.D. Lewis, who also had a vacant home for rental in Selwood, said that on October 20th, she was approached by a short man with a somewhat dark complexion who'd arrived in a beat-up car. He rudely barged into the home and quickly went up to the attic. From there, he called to Lewis to come up to look at a door. Thinking better of it, she did not go up into the attic. The man would come back down and abruptly went into the basement where he called her down, claiming the furnace down there was broke. At this point, Lewis was scared enough that she left the house, and this occurred only blocks from Mabel Fluke's home. It's also interesting that this man made a point of checking the attic and the basement, the two locations where these three murder victims had ended up. But as quickly as concerns about a mad killer were spreading around town, the death stopped. And while today it is generally accepted that these three women were murdered, and murdered by the same man, at the time, a coroner's jury actually reached a different conclusion for each victim. They were split on a suicide murder cause for Beta Withers. They determined Virginia Grant died of natural causes, and despite clear evidence to the contrary, they determined Mabel Fluke committed suicide. This along with conflicting attitudes by the police, prevented an in-depth investigation from happening. And the fact that the deaths stopped only furthered the stagnation on this matter. But this would all change about a month later. On November 29, 1926, 48-year-old Blanche Myers, whose first name was Mary, but she went by her middle name Blanche, was looking to rent a room out of a house on the southwest end of town. Around noon, Blanche had lunch in that home with her son and a man named Alexander Muir, the man who owned the home. After lunch, her son went back to school, and a man with a logger-type appearance showed up to look at the room. Muir said that Blanche didn't like the look of the man, but Muir left while they were still discussing the matter. A couple hours later, Blanche's son returned home and noticed a room for rent sign had been removed from the window. When he entered, he saw no signs of his mother and quickly phoned the police. When they arrived and searched the area, they discovered an obvious crime scene. In a side room, there were signs of a struggle as well as blood spatter in multiple spots. They continued the search 
and ultimately uncovered Blanche's body, which had been stuffed under a bed. Her mouth had been bound with a cloth. It was also revealed later that she'd been struck in the chest so hard that two of her ribs were broken. Multiple bloody fingerprints were found, but did not match any prints the police had on file. With the presumption that this logger was the killer, it caused hysteria all over town with most landlords not taking in people who actually worked as loggers. It would later be learned that this was likely all for naught. A witness came forward and said that another man had looked at the room around this same time that the logger was there, but claimed it was too expensive. The theory then shifted to this other man likely being the killer. This murder also revived interest in these three previous deaths, and almost overnight the attitude became that all four of these deaths were connected. Three of the murders were in southeast Portland, while the later Myers murder happened in southwest Portland. They were all single women, as Beta Withers was divorced in 1921, and the other three were widows. Both Virginia Grant and Mabel Fluke's husbands died only months before their own deaths. They all had items taken from their body or the home, including a discovery that all of Beta Withers' underwear had been taken. An early theory in this case was that a copycat killer of a man who was killing women in California's Bay Area was at work. But it didn't take long for even that theory to shift. Perhaps, just perhaps, the Portland killer and this Bay Area killer were one and the same. This is Earl Leonard Nelson, believed responsible for nearly 30 murders between 1926 and 1928. As one might expect, Nelson had both a difficult and dysfunctional upbringing. Born to a mother and father, both already in the throes of syphilis, on May 12, 1897, both his parents died during his infancy, leaving him to be raised by his religious zealot of a grandmother. As a young child, he was reprimanded in school for his violent outbursts, which would be followed a short time later by strange sexual problems. He was also struck by a streetcar when he was 10, leaving him in a coma for several days. This experience seemed to leave him even more unhinged. He seemed to develop delusions as he was often seen talking to people who weren't there. In 1915, at the age of 18, he would be busted for burglarizing a home he claimed he thought was abandoned. He was sent up to San Quentin for a few years, going into the military during World War I after his release. But shortly after enlisting, he became a deserter. In the following years, he would be tragically misdiagnosed as being non-violent, despite his clear issues. During a period of institutionalization, he escaped so many times that he earned the nickname of Houdini. He would eventually, as a man in his 20s, marry a woman 60 years of age. This proved to be a red flag as to the type of women he would eventually target as victims. His sexual issues had only progressed, leading to daily sexual demands that no one could fulfill. His demented desires first took effect on May 19, 1921, when he broke into a home and tried to assault a 12-year-old girl. His efforts were thwarted, but he was later apprehended and institutionalized once again, deemed a dangerous and unstable individual. Despite this, he would be discharged in 1925. Less than a year later, he would make any hospital that released him regret their decisions. His first known kill was a 60-year-old landlady named Clara Newman on February 20th, 1926. She was found strangled to death after a man had inquired about a rental there. Over the coming months, several women, mostly elderly, in that area 
turned up dead. Some of them ran rental properties. They were always sexually assaulted before being strangled. These killings briefly stopped in mid-August, before an Anna Edmonds was killed in San Francisco on November 18th. It just so happened those first three Portland deaths happened during this break in the Bay Area killings. Five days after the Edmonds murder, and only five days before Blanche Myers was killed, a wealthy widow named Florence Monks was killed in Washington. Like Virginia Grant, she was found stuffed behind a furnace, and she had also recently put her home on the market. The case was considered a possible Nelson murder. The day after Florence Monks was found dead in her home, a mystery man showed up at the rooming house run by a Sophia Yates and a Mrs. E.B. Gayford, two older women. This man identified himself as Adrian Harris. The woman said he was a kind and intelligent man of about 25 with a dark complexion. He was so nice that he bought the women, who were struggling financially, their Thanksgiving dinner. He also paid for a week's stay at their house, covering him through December 1st. However, he left on November 29th and never returned, the same day that Blanche Myers was killed. The belief was quickly reached that this Adrian Harris was Myers' killer and that he was Earl Leonard Nelson. Whoever he was, he also gave the struggling women some jewelry that he'd been carrying. This jewelry was later identified as belonging to Florence Monks. And this was the primary reason that a connection was established between the Monks and Myers murders. The next we hear from Nelson, he was in the Midwest, assaulting and killing two more women and an infant child. Nelson reportedly stayed in the general area between Philadelphia and Chicago before crossing over into Canada in June of 1927. Shortly after his arrival there, a 14-year-old girl was found brutally murdered at a rooming house he'd been staying at. This was a departure from his usual victim type, but it put the heat on, and he was ultimately apprehended while still in Canada. Earl Leonard Nelson was tried for two murders he committed in Canada, found guilty, and given a mandatory death sentence. He would be executed by hanging on January 13, 1928. He was known as the Dark Strangler, among other names like the Gorilla Man. All these names likely established in relation to Nelson's haggard, wide-eyed appearance. He was by far one of America's most prolific serial killers prior to the 1970s, perhaps its most prolific. It has always been taken at face value that, among Earl Nelson's victims, were these four women killed in Portland in 1926. But while he very well could have been their killers, after looking into the matter, I felt less convinced of his guilt than I had been before. In fact, I'm not convinced at all that he killed these women. And this is where I deviate from most people who have looked into this matter, who have not even considered the possibility that Nelson did not kill as many women as he's been given credit for. The following are my arguments. First off, it has always been just presumed that Nelson was responsible for killing Withers, Grant, Fluke, and Myers without question by most people who have looked into him as a killer. This evades many important questions. For one, I have found no evidence whatsoever that Earl Nelson was in Portland during October when three of these women were killed. Nor have I found any concrete evidence that he was in town when Blanche Myers was killed in November. Because there were some correlations with Nelson's victims in the Bay Area, people have been more than willing to just believe. But when it comes down to evidence, Blanche Myers is the only victim wherein there is any evidence, and that evidence is flimsy, relying mostly on eyewitness accounts, something that is 
far more weak than most of us want to admit. Again, the implication has been that Adrian Harris was also Blanche's killer. Yates and Gaylord described the man as being about 25 years old, and Nelson was 29 at this time. But, likely from rough living, he looked much older than he was. Definitely older than 25. And the man seen at Blanche's place, and believed to be her killer, was described as being older, about 35 to 45 years of age. Gaylord and Yates also said that Harris had an accent, implying him to be a foreigner. Nelson was born and grew up in the Bay Area around San Francisco. So if the man was certainly guilty of killing Florence Monks, there's questions as to if he killed Blanche Myers, or, of course, if he was Earl Leonard Nelson. Sophia Yates would identify a photograph of Nelson as this mysterious Adrian Harris. Mrs. M. D. Lewis also identified Nelson as the man who infiltrated her place in Portland. And then there was a store clerk who claimed a man he later identified as Nelson went to his Portland store during this time. However, like Ted Bundy decades later, Earl Nelson had an ever-changing face. Just look at these two pictures of him, taken not that far apart from each other. Earl Nelson did have an ever-changing appearance and, unlike Ted Bundy, didn't have to work hard to make it happen. He was identified based on old pictures that presented him in a way much different than how he looked in 1926. Eyewitness accounts, again, are often unreliable, but back in these earlier years of the 20th century, it was remarkably common for unreliable eyewitness identifications to be made. If it was presumed someone was guilty, that would often be enough for so-called eyewitnesses. Aside from these eyewitness accounts, I've never seen any definitive evidence that Earl Leonard Nelson was even in Portland when these four deaths occurred. It's always the same thing. Well, these people died in Portland, so yeah, he just went to Portland during that time. No explanation of why he'd gone there. He had no real connections there. And if it is theorized he went to Portland to escape the Bay Area, feeling the heat was closing in on him, well, why would he go back to Portland, another place where he had killed people? And why would he go back to the Bay Area after killing those first three women in Portland? I have my doubts that Nelson was ever in the City of Roses. And if he wasn't there, he wasn't the killer. Nelson was known to strangle his victims. He may have not strangled them all, but rarely was that not his method of killing. Strangulation is almost always easy to recognize by marks on the victim's throat, and yet two of these four women, Beta Withers and Virginia Grant, did not show any evidence of being strangled. And Nelson not only strangled all of his victims, but he sexually assaulted them as well. While I have seen some unreliable resources say otherwise, in all the newspaper articles, statements from those individuals in the investigation, and pieces written by historians I've poured over, I did not find one reference to any of these four Portland victims being sexually assaulted. How could Beta Withers and Mabel Fluke have been sexually assaulted and strangled and yet their deaths were still contemplated as suicides. If Virginia Grant was sexually assaulted and robbed, how could her death be so easily dismissed as being from natural causes? And in the case of Blanche Myers, all those bloody fingerprints found at the scene of her murder, I found nothing to suggest those were tested against Nelson's fingerprints, which should have been an obvious thing to do. What are the odds that a man who killed almost 30 women would sexually assault all of them except for women specifically from Portland? All four women were setting up rentals, which certainly fit Nelson's M.O., but he was hardly the first and only person to see an isolated woman offering space in an empty house as a murderous opportunity. 
and why didn't he kill the two older women he was rooming with? They matched his type of victim. Perhaps others were staying at the house and he didn't want any witnesses. It's hard to say as we don't know. I still find it odd, especially considering another aspect of this story. Gaylord and Yates stated that when they started arguing over the jewelry that the man gave them, that he went into a rage, but he didn't kill them. And again, let's take a moment to assess the coroner's jury that was convened. Beta Withers was the only case they contemplated as a murder, and even in that instance, they were split on whether it was a murder or a suicide. In the case of Virginia Grant, again, natural causes, which I honestly would not have a problem with if the house had not also been ransacked. Did a thief randomly pick that house to rob around the time she died? Somehow I doubt these possibilities. And perhaps most questionable, Mabel Fluke's death determined to be a suicide. The cause of death on her death certificate was marked as strangulation, written in pencil. This infers murder if someone was strangled. But then, clearly later on, the word suicide was added in darker ink. Now I'm no medical professional, but the odds of the Withers and Fluke murders being a suicide is ridiculously low as far as I'm concerned. Withers killed herself in a trunk and then managed to stuff her body in and cover herself with clothes? One could argue, well, her cause of death couldn't be determined, so how do you know it wasn't a suicide? Well, that's just it. We don't know how she died, so we can't just say it was suicide. And Fluke killed herself by strangulation with a scarf? Maybe. But she was found in the attic of her home, like Withers was. Items had gone missing from her home. And she was preparing a property to rent out. Not exactly the behavior of a woman about to take her own life. Blanche Myers was obviously a murder, no doubt. But even in her case, her primary link to the Dark Strangler is the Monk's murder and the accounts of Yates and Gaylord. And all this proves is that Florence Monk's killer was in Portland when Myers was killed. The timing makes him a likely suspect, but we do not know for sure if this Adrian Harris was, for a fact, Myers' killer. And even the Monk's murder was only described as a possible Earl Nelson kill. Thus, we cannot even say for an absolute certainty that Nelson was Harris. But in regards to these previous three deaths, I personally feel that Withers and Fluke were killed by the same individual. Maybe Earl Nelson, maybe not. And Virginia Grant, if she was murdered, I personally feel was unrelated to the rest of them. She just happened to be killed around the same time. Certainly none of this proves that Nelson was not the killer in this case, and I still think it could have been him, but I have strong doubts. I just haven't seen any real solid evidence of his guilt, and this is critical because if Earl Nelson was not the killer in this case, then who was? Was it another well-established killer, or was it another dark strangler we've never heard of? It's very possible at least some of these murders were the work of an unknown killer. These were not the only unsolved murders of women on their own during this time in Portland. In fact, it was very common in Portland for single women to be attacked, especially when they had their own home or a vacant home they were looking to rent or sell. There were a few interesting events that followed the Withers, Grant, and Fluke deaths, including a woman who got herself into some legal trouble when she kept calling in fake tips on these cases. And a few days after these deaths, a man with several aliases by the name of Axel Mickelson came to the police's attention. He matched well with a man seen near Beta Withers' home the day that she died, and on October 27th, he stormed a home just outside of Portland, chasing the family living there out into the streets. While they got the police, 
Mickelson made himself at home, later arrested while taking a nap in the house. A week after Blanche Myers was murdered, a man, using the name of Harris, was apprehended in Eugene, Oregon. He said his real name was Morris Yaffe. He'd been in Eugene a couple of days, and the landlord at the house where he was staying said he'd go into hiding in his room whenever anyone else showed up there. Upon being detained, the first question he asked police was if he was taken in in relation to the murder in Seattle that being the Florence Monk's murder. According to papers, he also matched very closely with the description given of Adrian Harris, seen in Portland. His prints would be taken and compared with the prints found in the Myers home, which would ultimately lead to his release when the prints didn't match. While not having a print match is pretty damning, I still wonder Yaffe apparently matched the description of Adrian Harris. Why did he appear to be hiding in his room in Eugene? Why did he immediately ask about the monk's murder? Why would a guy arrested in Eugene immediately think it was related to something that happened in Seattle? During the coroner's jury on the killings, it was revealed that the police received a letter from someone identifying themselves as an 18-year-old flapper. In this letter, she took credit for killing these three women and, ominously enough, said that she'd killed another person and that they'd find her body in a couple weeks. And then, Blanche Myers was killed a couple weeks later. This person then signed her name as She Murderess. And in the case of Beta Withers, perhaps the most confounding of all these deaths she had been seeing a man named Bob Frenzel, who had not mentioned to her that he was already married. It does not appear he was even really considered as a suspect, but he'd hardly be the first person to get mixed up in murder when it came to having another woman. A diary Beta kept revealed her clearly strong emotional connection to Bob and her broken-heartedness upon learning he was married. And yet, this was the guy who helped Beta's son search the house for her, searching the trunk first and not finding her, which sounds unlikely since her son found her in there so quickly. I almost wonder, on a whim, if Bob Frenzel made sure to be there and to check the trunk first in an effort to control the search. But if he was responsible for that murder, it would mean somebody else entirely killed Mabel Fluke. When Blanche Myers was killed later on, while it was considered that the Bay Area Strangler, or a copycat, may have been responsible, it was also considered at this point that the killer may have been an escaped mental patient. If the same person killed all of these women, this individual must have been on the lam for a long time. But authorities never found a suspect to fit this type. I chose to dive in in search of other possible cases that may be tied to these, indicating another possible killer. And there is one particular case that I feel might be connected to at least some of these. On June 25, 1927, 32-year-old Zell Stebbins was found bound and strangled to death in her West Side Portland apartment. A man named Ben Glazer was briefly held making wild claims that he knew the killer, but that it would take an army of cops to capture him. And, interestingly enough, for a brief period of time, Earl Nelson was considered as a suspect in this murder, but a check showed he'd been elsewhere when this crime happened. Whatever the case, the Stebbins murder was never solved, but it was a strangulation murder, and it happened only seven months after Blanche Myers was killed, less than two miles away. There were two other strangulation murders that happened a little further down the road, which might have some connection to these 1926 murders, but not to Earl Leonard Nelson. In July 1931, a woman named Anna Morris was suffocated in her apartment on Portland's waterfront. Another crime that was never solved. In 
August 1930, a fortune teller named Catherine Deering was strangled to death in her hotel room on Broadway Street. Her murder, too, was never solved. Could the Dark Strangler have been responsible for some of, if not all, of these four murders he's been credited for? Sure. As much as it can't be fully proven he was in Portland when they happened, it also can't be proven that he wasn't there. I understand the reasons why he quickly gained attention in these cases, and there's good reasons for that. But it still bewilders me that nobody, as far as I can tell, has really considered the possibility that someone else, or multiple other people, could have been responsible for these Portland murders, even if only considered as a passive, unlikely theory. Certainly, serial killers were far less common than they would be in later years, making it easier to believe that if some circumstances between crimes were similar, it was probably the same person since there weren't many vicious killers like this out there. But again, from my perspective, I seriously question whether these four Portland deaths were all connected to one killer. For the time being, the conclusion that I draw from the available information is that until more information is available, I don't think we can close the book and say the Dark Strangler for certain killed four Portland women back in 1926.